topic this afternoon is extraordinarily important, increasingly urgent, and somewhat unfashionable. We're at a time when public interest in what might be called soul craft or character formation seems to be in decline. The institutions that once formed character have in many ways been stressed or strained. Families are often increasingly unstable, church attendance is declining among the young, and the schools and universities have largely shed the character formation focus that was once considered central to their mission. Even the vocabulary used to describe character and moral leadership has demonstrably declined, crowded out by the language of advancement, gain, winning, and domination. At the same time, we're experiencing increasing conflict in the public square over what is right and increased confusion over what is true, both of which have moral dimensions. Our interest in moral leadership may, according to some indicators, have waned, but our need for it only grows. So it is a great honor as well as a pleasure to introduce two renowned scholars of moral leadership who have cultivated much of their lives to not just the study of character, but also its wise cultivation. Dr. Robert Franklin is a scholar, author, education leader, and leadership expert. He currently serves the Laney Professor of Moral Leadership at Emory University, and previously served as the president of Morehouse College and the president of the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta. He's the author of several books, including Crisis in the Village, Another Day's Journey, Liberating Visions, From Culture Wars to Common Ground, and his latest book just out in April, Moral Leadership, Integrity, Courage, and Imagination, which we've invited him to discuss today. In addition, we're delighted to get to host uh, Professor Michael Lamb. Dr. Lamb is a professor of politics, ethics, and interdisciplinary humanities, as well as the executive director of the Program for Leadership and Character at Wake Forest University, and a research fellow at the Oxford University Character Project. A former Rhodes Scholar, Michael's scholarship focuses largely on the ethics of citizenship and the virtues of public life, and he will soon, at least next year, be releasing a new book entitled A Commonwealth of Hope, Reimagining Augustine's Political Thought. Bob and Michael, welcome. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Good to be with you. Great to be here, Sheree. Thank you. Absolutely. So as we start off, it's always good to start just by defining our terms. And certainly moral leadership and character are terms that have been bandied about quite a bit with different meanings. And Bob, since you have literally written the book on moral leadership, I'd love to start with you on this. What is moral leadership and what is character? Thanks, Sherry. And to uh, Michael, good to be with you and all those viewing today. I define moral leaders as women and men of integrity, courage, and imagination who serve the common good while inviting others to join them. That's my short definition. And thereafter, I offer examples of moral leadership that we can talk about later. Oh, that sounds great. And uh, Michael, I know you have done a lot with character. Are there any additional uh, definitional nuances that we should think about when we think about character? I do think, uh, as Dr. Franken said, I think those virtues of courage, integrity, and imagination are very crucial to what good leadership is. I do think there are other virtues, too, that are quite relevant. And I think we think about justice as being a virtue that's especially relevant in our current moment. Humility to learn and to understand people who are different from ourselves, as well as empathy as being a very guiding uh, virtue for our contemporary moment. So I think ways we think about moral leadership really require understanding how the virtues might inform who we are and how we lead. Mm -hmm. That's great. So there seems to be a widespread, even growing sense that not only is character in leaders in decline, but perhaps surprisingly that it might not be necessary after all. And the reason I say this, I'm quoting a study that found that evangelicals, which formerly more than any other religious group or any demographic group really in the country, used to believe that character and morality was absolutely essential to wise leadership. Uh, but the Public Religion Research Institute found that actually uh, that has declined from over 70% of evangelicals to just 30%. Uh, who believe that it is essential now. Uh, Michael, what would you say to those who don't find character necessary to leadership? Why does character matter? 
I think it matters for many reasons. Uh, one is I think leadership's not only about getting results, it's about how we treat other people. Uh, leaders are those who have followers. Without having followers or teammates, uh, there's no leader. And so uh, the real way to really understand leadership is, is a relationship among people in a group. And so I think in that sense, having the kind of relationship that does embody trust and care and compassion is crucial. And I think character really captures those core virtues of what really a leader should, should embody and how they should practice their own leadership. Great. Uh, Bob, I'd love for you to jump in on this because I know you've made the point several times in your book, which is a point that the founders made as well, which is that democracy requires virtue and character. Uh, so what is the link between our character and our, our national security? Well, I really appreciate Michael highlighting this concept of relationship in the context of leadership and character as a defining feature of, of leadership beyond mere competence or technical expertise and rationality, the importance of integrity and of character, of trustworthiness uh, is, is, is a quality that has an interesting effect because it not only makes the leader more effective at what she or he is, is doing, but also transforms the lives of followers. That's uh, James McGregor Burns' wonderful insight in his thick book on leadership and distinguishing between transactional leaders and transformational leaders. And those transformational leaders have, through the course of their relationship with their followers, actually elevate and, and transform the kind of motivations that people have uh, as they go about their work together. So I think ultimately that's what we're looking for. And, it, and, and to hear you cite those statistics about how many evangelicals seem to be making some compromises and adjusting their ethical principles to rationalize or defend or uh, recruit a certain kinds of leadership is really quite troubling. I mean, Gallup has been telling us for years that nearly half of the American public is worried about the decline of moral values. And uh, as you said, from the very beginning of the Republic, I mean, you think of John Adams, you think of Abigail Adams, and so many others across the uh, decades, they have been concerned that our Republic requires a certain amount of virtue, character, and integrity. Mm -hmm. That's great. So both of you are at university, and um, I see both of you are surrounded by books. I want to talk, ask you a little bit about literature and literature's role in forming character and forming leaders. Uh, I think back to uh, C.S. Lewis, who introduced us to the character of Eustace Scrub. We knew right away that he was bad news when C.S. Lewis told us that he had never read a book about dragons, but only imports, exports, and plumbing drains. And when he was actually confronted with moral evil and moral danger uh, I, I, in the form of a real life dragon, he didn't know what to do because he'd never read books, great books uh, about, about dragons. So I'd love to hear both of you comment, maybe my, well, we can start with you, on the role that you find literature playing in terms of developing character and then any uh, books that you believe are particularly helpful, stories that are particularly helpful in uh, fulfilling that function. Okay, well, I love great literature and I think um, it is very crucial to how we think about who we become. Literature gives us a chance to really understand um, complex characters over our life and how they relate to other characters in a novel. It helps us expand our moral imagination to think about new ideas or new, new context. It also helps us think about our empathy and help us develop that. Uh, research has shown that reading great literature compared to nonfiction or even to airport novels uh, has a significant impact on our capacity for empathy and imagination. So I think it really does matter to how we think about who we are and how we lead. Uh, when I was in Oxford, we helped start a group called the Ethics Through Fiction Film Reading Group to look, understand how fiction and film of the same same story, but through different genres, might affect our moral imagination. So we might read Tony, Tony Morrison's Beloved. I think about the way that the film and the book might help us understand that moral complexity. Um, one book I'm reading right now for a, a Project Wake discussion at Wake Forest on literature and character is Frankenstein, which often seemed to be this Halloween horror story. Uh, but actually, when you look at the novel, it's formed as a real character story, the story of the monster's formation of character in relation to the communities he encounters along the way and how different people treat him affects his character fundamentally. And so we can imagine that kind of 
formation, we can understand how we're being formed and perhaps re re reform our own characters in ways that make it more empathetic, more just, and more humble. That's great. I think ancient Greeks offer us an important insight into the power of imagination, of drama, of literature, into performed arts as an invitation to reflect on the nature of the good life, the good person, and the good community. And uh, just following uh, Michael's important insight there, great drama has always pointed to these, these, these virtues, uh, the complexity of, of human character. Um, I think about Robert Coles at Harvard University and the way in which he really almost became an evangelist for moral leadership in the medical school, business school, divinity school. And then he sort of impacted the entire university, one professor. And part of it was he was asking people to read excerpts or entire uh, works of great literature and talk about the character traits, the virtues, the flaws, the complexities. Uh, you know, what a genius uh, in terms of methodology. People really got into it. And as, as a result, it really took off and I think has important, uh, 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 serves as an important model for today. I was just thinking of how much my students appreciate uh, Victor Hugo, Les Miserables, and reading the character Jean Valjean. Communities and students who are first generation students in college coming out of poverty who have lived every week with the temptation to behave badly in order to survive, not just to you know acquire and get a hit, to survive. And the, and when they meet Jean Valjean, they say, I know this guy, I am this guy. Or today, as we reflect on the tragedy of George Floyd and the nation, the world, I mean, for God's sake, even the Pope mentioned George Floyd in his general audience comments uh, in June. That never happens. But uh, the, the life of George Floyd, the parable of George Floyd is in many ways sort of anticipated by great authors like uh, Ralph Ellison in the book, The Invisible Man. I hope people will read that, use that in classes and, and discussion groups. Or of James Baldwin's work, or Richard Wright, Black Boy. There are a number of uh, important texts that invite us into the life world and, and cultivate and inspire a sense of empathy and understanding. So of course I'm thinking, was there a story that particularly influenced your character as a young person? Ah, uh, you know, I begin my book, Moral Leadership, not with a, um, a, an excerpt from literature, but from the study of a life, uh, my grandmother's life. And uh, she, would, she really inspired me in an incredible way because I watched her one day, we were, grew up on the, I grew up on the south side of Chicago, a time when Chicago street gangs were uh, world famous. And uh, there were two groups of young men uh, about to uh, have a conflict right in front of our house. My grandmother, not my mother or father, my grandmother was in the kitchen preparing a meal. She ran out and stood in between these two groups of young men about to go to war. And she said, young men, no one is going to fight here today. Uh, I know what it's like for a mother to receive the phone call. Your child has been injured or wounded or killed. I received that call when my son served in the U.S. Army in Italy during World War II. And I have fed most of your families from that little garden next door. And I know your mothers and how this would break their hearts. It was fascinating. I was all of eight or nine years old. She was ruining my reputation right here in front of all these tough guys. And uh, I watched them look at her and look at each other and then look to their own groups and look back at her and they slowly backed away. And I said, oh my God, that's the power of one person of courage and integrity, of compassion to turn things around. And we of course have seen examples of this even in more recent uh, protests and uprisings in, uh, in American cities. So Sherry, I don't have a, a particular story from literature, but it's a story from practical life that, that counts. Uh, that's why I wrote the book. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Michael, what about you? Is there a story that influenced your character as a, as a boy? Well, I think, I think Robert's views are right. We have different exemplars in our lives, and those can be fictional, or they can actually be actual. And my parents, for me, were my exemplars growing up. My dad 
taught me how to work and to sacrifice. I see him come home after a long day at the factory making engines for trucks, change his boots and go back on the farm for several more hours to work some more, all to support our family. And he still made time somehow to coach our little league teams and serve on the school board and also lead our local Lions Club. My mother taught me how to serve. She was one of the people in our town who was always collecting food and clothes for families, often without anybody ever knowing what she was doing. When I was in Memphis in college, I was tutoring kids in local schools there, and she heard they had no school supplies. She spent a month gathering pencils, markers, crayons, notebooks to bring a whole truckload, literally, to Memphis for those kids. And so I think her example of service were, was something I actually really grappled with my very first uh, years on this, on this planet. Uh, in her very first words to me, my baby book, she wrote a letter to me. She wrote, Dear Michael, hope you become a kind person, a compassionate and forgiving person who helps those who are less fortunate than yourself. Those are her very first words to me and her first hope for who I would become. And so I think her example, her vision for me, uh, along with my dad, um, gave me the kind of text, the kind of uh, model to live into that life of character in ways that I still um, find meaningful today. That's a beautiful story. I, I wonder yeah, if I could add a quick observation uh, because we both now talked about these extraordinary familial models and examples. And I think, you know, our viewers today, all of us need to think about who were the women and men in our lives that embodied uh, moral leadership, embodied the virtues in a way that really challenges us, holds us accountable. But the one story I'll just mention in passing wasn't until high school. I didn't know this story existed, did, had never heard of the author, but I, uh, I got into a little trouble in high school, let's say. It was related to organizing protests. So I think John Lewis would say it was good trouble, but I, it, was, it was a little <laughs> uh, ambiguous. But the story, the principal said, look, we're going to have you go home for three days, but I want you to read this book. And that's a fascinating sentence. They give me a reading assignment while I'm in trouble and suspended from high school. And the book was The Razor's Edge by Somerset Maugham. And I read the story of this young wanderer who was so promising, who was going to earn uh, lots of money in his life. But he, he, grew, uh, he grew disenchanted with that life, not unlike the Buddha, by the way, and just walked away from it and began to travel. He travels the world and has these incredible stories and experiences and ultimately lands in a fascinating place. So that became that, that notion of the travel log as moral literature that uh, I know Michael has also worked with that theme. That, oh, that's great. You know, Bob, your, your story of your grandmother and her courage makes me want to ask you a little bit uh, about its opposite, fear. Mm. Now, we're in fearful and anxious times right now. Just there's lots of studies showing that people are fearing, feeling much more fear and anxiety as we're in the midst of, you know, really sort of crisis and triplicate, a public health crisis, a financial and economic crisis, you know, and a, a crisis of the commons, really. Mm. And I wanted to ask, we'll start with you, just how do leaders deal with fear? And that, you know, fear tends to bring out the worst in our characters, and behavior. So many leaders have said, you know, uh, the worst thing to fear is fear itself. You know, we, that's what, what we have to fear. How, does, how do leaders, uh, moral leaders, both deal with fear in their own life, but also deal with fear among those that they are leading? Yeah, in, in a word, that's an important question for all of us during these times when there's so much uncertainty. And as you say, I mean, we don't know what COVID-19 will do, how it will impact our lives. Uh, but for most of us on this call today, many of us know people who've been directly uh, affected. So the fear at that level and then so many other uh, dimensions of the economic crisis, tensions around racial uh, injustice, etc. I think in a word, Martin King would say you deal with fear honestly, admit that this is frightening, try to understand uh, in, intellectually and emotionally why it, what does it, this threaten? And then begin to draw on the inner resources of, of hope and of faith uh, to move forward uh, in courage. He had that wonderful uh, moment in a speech that said, uh, you know, uh, cowardice asks, is it safe? Uh, expedience asks, is it politic? Vanity asks, is it popular? But conscience asks, is it right? 
And there comes a time when we must do and act, not because it is popular or politic or safe, but because it is right. And I think as long as we align ourselves with the higher virtues of what is right and good and just, we're standing in a good place in history. And I think history will embrace us. Right thinking people will embrace us. And those of us who are people of faith certainly believe that uh, uh, the Almighty uh, will embrace us. That's great. Uh, Michael, I wanted to ask you about some of the contradictions that um, moral leaders face in that, you know, most people when asked would say that the very virtues that your mom inscribed to you, you know, in your baby book, you know, to try to call forth, you know, name and call forth those qualities and you know, wisdom, empathy, humility. Um, most people would say that those are central to moral leadership. But when you look at times at um, political behavior, it seems like often people actually vote for or support um, leaders who are domineering, self-promoting, uh, narcissistic, you know, this is across parties. Uh, as a scholar of leadership and character, what makes us gravitate towards unworthy leaders? And what counsel would you give to help citizens uh, discern moral leaders from the self-impressed? It's a great question, Cherie, and I think important one for our current moment. Um, you look at our larger culture, we often celebrate the, 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 bad, the bad examples. You have you know, shows about Lucifer, for example, or Breaking Bad, are kind of lifting up these characters in our own popular imagination of, that are really complicated and morally. I think um, culture obviously has a, a role to play in that. I think what's important to recognize is that it's easy for us to castigate our, our current leaders or other leaders across various sectors, but often we choose them. And so it's up to us as citizens think about what our virtues are and how we form ourselves to choose that kind of leader. Um, I do think that um, one crucial aspect of character that I think is relevant for leadership is the way that it connects to trust. What we find in the research on trust is that people trust others who are competent and also have good character. Those are crucial components of what trust is. And so we see now um, that we have leaders who are at lower levels of trust across the whole society, in politics, in government, in the clergy even. Uh, lowest numbers since 1977 in Gallup polling about how people trust their clergy or not. I think across society we have a real, a real crisis of trust now. And so I think character is one way to think about how we can really foster trust again and why that's important for having a, a community that's not so divided. I think right now Americans are very divided. I think we're also very tired of being divided. <laughs> and I think it's a real opening for us now to think about how trust might help unite us uh, in light of this division. Mm -hmm. you know, Bob, I'd love for you to comment on that, but I want to throw another internal mm -hmm. contradiction into the mix too for you to comment on as well. And that is that you write a lot in your book about the importance of inclusivity uh, for moral leaders. Uh, but one of the, again, the contradictions that we see is that, you know, really for the last decade or so, maybe 15 years, you know, it's been a maximum within politics that you win by turning out the base more so than uh, appealing, you know, across different ideological lines. So if one is rewarded essentially for turnout as opposed to inclusivity, uh, how does one uh, cultivate the kind of moral leaders who will essentially go against their best interests when it comes to extending inclusivity in their leadership. Yeah, I'm so glad you highlight that, that notion that sometimes moral leaders are called to act in ways that may on its surface appear to be against their own personal self-interest. Mm -hmm. And yet they, they do serve and advance a larger, higher call and purpose. Uh, I think we all expect moral leaders to be responsive to that, to that note in the octave, that, that there is something higher, something more transformative, uh, something more than the immediate and uh, satisfaction of winning um, that, that calls us to, to behave in ways in which we're willing to sacrifice, willing to share, willing to think about the... Uh, the challenges of the least advantaged members of the community. Recall that phrase from John Rawls's wonderful and important classic theory of justice. The least advantaged members of the community. Who cares about them? Who speaks for them in our political discourse today? 
And so I think that we really ought to uh, call forth such leadership. We need to reward uh, such leadership because often such leaders will, uh, will lose elections. Uh, they will be uh, tar and feathered in the media. Uh, but uh, those are the leaders who are embodying something important and inclusivity. Mm -hmm. The sense that we can, despite our brokenness, we can pull a community uh, and pull this nation together. Uh, that's where we all need to become students of Abraham Lincoln. And you've had wise scholars in recent weeks on the Trinity Forum uh, talking about people like uh, Lincoln and others, but especially Lincoln. I mean, he really had the unique challenge of a, a nation, actually Americans killing each other over ideas and loyalties. Mm -hmm. And I think we are certainly in that zone, in tone uh, at this time. I, I pray not uh, with respect to actual mobilizations, uh, but, but, but how do we find leaders who know that tone and can adapt it to this specific moment in history? Uh, in, and not only in the presidential election coming in uh, less than 100 days, but also in state and local uh, races. Let's celebrate that. I mean, in the book, I talk about uh, the Mount Rushmore and those four U.S. presidents that are carved in the, uh, the granite of uh, the Black Hills in South Dakota. But I pose an exercise right there in the first chapter. What if you were to identify four moral leaders whom you would nominate to be carved in, in granite as the, more, the moral Mount Rushmore, as it were. Who are the morally, the people who act with integrity and courage and empathy and wisdom, who serve the common good, not just their own constituents, their base, and also who are inviting, who are inclusive, who are trying to enlist a broader group of people. And I wonder, you know, even as our, our, our viewers are listening now, I'd love to see during our Q&A, nominations of people. Let me just close with observations. The names that have emerged in my classes recently, both at Emory University and at Morehouse College, have been people like Brian Stevenson, the, the lawyer at the Equal Justice Initiative, people like uh, Pope Francis, uh, the Dalai Lama, uh, even interesting individuals, Howard Schultz of Starbucks. His effort, a failed and flawed effort, but an effort to start a conversation about race in the corporate sector, fascinating. And I write about that, that even those failures, we, uh, we ended up uh, falling forward. So uh, the Mount Rushmore. So Bob, who's on your Mount Rushmore? Oh, wow. Yeah, so I, I always ask my class to think about people who are alive. It's easy to sort of reify and, and, and glorify uh, people who have passed on and are, are no longer around to make mistakes, right? I want living flesh and blood human beings who are struggling against the odds in this moment to do the best they can and to serve the common good while inviting others. So uh, certainly, uh, well, let me mention two young women, Malala Yousafzai. Here's a, a young woman shot in the head for trying to promote girls' education uh, in Afghanistan. Or Greta Thunberg and the way in which she's challenged the world about climate uh, responsibility and ethics. Uh, so I would begin uh, with those two leaders. And uh, in the book, I also highlight Ella Baker, a name that not many know, but she should be known because I think she's the patron saint of all young people who are protesting in the streets these days. Ella Baker, who helped found the Student Nonviolent, Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, mm -hmm. and then Dolores Huerta, who is alive today and was one of the leaders with Cesar Chavez who helped launch what became the United Farm Workers. That's great. Well, we're going to turn to audience questions in just a second, but before we do, I can't leave without asking uh, you, Michael, at least one question about Augustine, since you have a book coming out. Uh, and of course, you know, Augustine talked largely about virtue and what he called the ordering of the loves, and you can speak much more to this than, than I can. Uh, but my understanding is that essentially what we love most, the proper ordering of what we love, uh, is the basis of a well-ordered character and of moral leadership. So I guess you, know, in a sense, my question is Tina Turner's, what does love have to do with it? And how do you encourage the proper ordering of loves in a young person? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I think love for Gustin is the central virtue, the spring of all other virtues and emotions and affections. And I think for him, he even defines virtue in the city of God as rightly ordered love. And so I think in that sense, I think there are ways to think about um, how we cultivate good loves and also how to recognize when we have bad loves or, or disordered loves. Often it's loves directed towards self. How do we understand how our loves are being directed towards self? How are certain biases perhaps directing us toward things we don't even realize? So being aware of our own biases is very crucial for, for directing our loves in the right way. Um, he also has practices of, of unselfing. Uh, for him, prayer is an important practice of unselfing, of really ordering yourself to someone else, uh, to God, um, but also service for him. He, he was very active. Augustine's known for his big books, City of God, over a thousand pages. He wrote 113 books over his life and hundreds of letters and sermons. But um, his life is a really example of, of properly ordered love. He was active in his own community. Uh, he was helping to advocate for those who were poor. Uh, he actually poured, uh, poured silver of his chalices to melt it down to free slaves in his own time. So he was very active actually taking the love and making it active in, in the world. It wasn't just a love that was sentimental or private. It was public. And I think the more public he became, the more he really embodied that kind of love. So I would encourage um, current generations to think about how they actually love in public. How do they actually take their loves beyond their own confines uh, in the communities who need, need their love and learn from those communities and really engage in kind of solidarity with them as an expression of that deep compassion and care. So I think in that sense, ordering our loves really requires going beyond ourselves and opening ourselves to the other who might be very different from who we are. That's great. So many more questions to ask you both, but we're, oh, Bob, we'll give you the last just, one here. Just, I want to build on this in a, in a different way to make a, a point about vocation. I love this uh, reflection on love. And this is a, a statement by Helen Bendler, who was a tenure professor at Harvard, who said that the role of teachers, and I would add parents as well, is to teach your students to love what you have loved. That is the ultimate call of good teachers and good parents. Teach your young people to love what you have loved, the books, the music, the experiences, the travel, et cetera. Well, we're grateful both of you are at universities doing that. And like I said, many more questions. We may have to have you all back at some point, but we're gonna turn now to questions from the audience and we have quite a few of them. And again, if you joined us just in the last few minutes, you can not only pose a question, but you can also like a question. And the more likes a question has, the more likely we are to be able to get to it in the next half hour or so. So our first question comes from Ginny Savage, who has a question for Dr. Franklin. She asks, in your essay, Moral Leadership, a vocation for the next generation, you encourage living a morally exemplary life. How do we foster living a morally exemplary life in an age of American individualism? Wonderful question. What tension we all face living a good life a life informed by the highest virtues, whether it's the theological virtues of faith and hope and love, or some of the classical virtues of prudence, of temperance, of justice and courage. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real uh, may, uh, challenge and we need communities to hold us uh, accountable and affirm us even as we attempt to do so. I think the other point I make in making that claim about what it is moral leaders think and do in the second chapter of the book. I also note that as, they, as we, as we all seek to live morally exemplary lives, uh, we should do so undaunted by failure, that we all will encounter frustrations, challenges. It doesn't all come out the way we had hoped. And that's you know, part of the challenge, that's part of the power of tragedy. Uh, from ancient literature, but uh, bad things happen to good people. And so we live with that sense, whether in the life of faith, with that sense of grace that it'll all work out and get worked out, or even in the sense of a kind of secular pragmatism, okay, we didn't get it right that time, we can try again, we can learn. Um, and, and so I think that's, uh, that's our challenge, not to be undaunted, but also to aim high. And uh, that's our call today. That's great. Our next question comes from Christopher Crawford. And Michael, maybe we can start with you on this one. Chris asks, how should moral leaders consider humility? 
Many people misunderstand humility. They think of it as a call to hold back our talents and gifts. For our black and brown brothers and sisters especially, the term humility can be used as a weapon for superiors to keep them in their place, so to speak. How do you define humility? And how can we express this value in a way that does not limit people's capabilities or hold people back? It's a great question. Um, I think often humility is seen as self-deprecation or self-denial in some way, and that's the kind of popular understanding of humility in certain discourses. Um, I teach it quite differently than that. I think it's a very important virtue, but it's really about the, the proper self-estimation, uh, recognizing who we are in both our weaknesses, but also our strengths, and to understand how they actually inform how we act in the world. So I think in that sense, I teach it as a, as a sort of a virtue between two vices. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, you have self-denial or self-deprecation, we also have pride or arrogance on the other hand. How do we actually avoid both of those extremes to find humility as, as kind of the virtue that goes between them in a way that helps us recognize who we are without denying the value we bring to the world, but also without over-exaggerating our own importance or our own ability. That's great. I, th I love, uh, it was a prime minister, Israeli prime minister, Golda Meir, who said to her defense uh, minister, Moshe Dayan, don't be so humble, you're not that great. Uh, it's always a way of keeping us, uh, you know, in our place. But I do think the, uh, the, 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 our viewer who poses this important question called attention to an interesting social dynamic that's occurred in our history, especially in the U.S., but in all co colonized uh, uh, nations, uh, where those who have been the oppressed have been taught to remain um, uh, a suppliant and, and, and uh, not to question their calling in life, not to resist, uh, but to simply accept that. And I think that uh, that's why I like uh, Michael's focus on love, because the love ethic that we find in Hebrew scripture and in the New Testament, Jesus is calling people to stand up, to love themselves, to be who they are, to recognize their status in the presence of the Almighty which is made in God's image and hence to be respected. And so at times, love prompts that person who might otherwise be inclined to uh, be self-effacing to really stand up, to speak the truth in love and to resist injustice because God would not want uh, innocent children to be uh, disrespected and harmed. So even the quiet must get loud uh, in those times, as John Lewis would say, get in the way, get, make good trouble. If you see something that's wrong, um, say something, do something. I'm I'm say, process. Oh, go ahead, Michael. I'll have one more point on that. I think to, to echo Robert here, I think one thing about the virtues, they all have to be related to each other. You can't have one virtue without the other virtues. So you need humility, you also need justice, you need courage. And so each situation will require different virtues. So I think having some kind of coherent, unified, character it's going to be very important for how we exercise humility properly in light of justice, courage, and other virtues. That's great. So Bob, I'm going to throw this next one to, uh, to you first, at least. Uh, our next question comes from Brooke Sorensen, who asks, in an increasingly pluralistic society, how do we balance our own moral ideals and sense of character with leaders who can adequately lead beyond tribal differences? That's one of the great challenges of all leaders uh, today. That is this complex relationship between particularity and universality is one way of framing that uh, old question. And I think that uh, one has to be true to one's particularity, uh, but also constantly reaching, aspiring to find what the theologian Howard Thurman called common ground. We should ever be in search of common ground. And the best sort of public witness of my particular faith commitments, for instance, mm -hmm. is to be true to that in such a way that I connect with uh, those deep truths in other traditions. Uh, that's abstract, but here's a practical example. Martin Luther King Jr. reared in a Christian tradition, uh, but he found in Gandhi, a Hindu, the method and strategies for social change, nonviolent social change. He said, gosh, this is the best way to translate what it means to practice love in public space where there is injustice and wrongdoing and institutional and individual racism is to, to, to not cooperate with it, to practice civil disobedience, and in so doing, never to dehumanize your opponent. 
That's what King always taught us. You may be angry, you may want to confront, but never dehumanize. And I think that is the challenge of being true to your own ethical principles. I think intellectual curiosity is also important. I write about this. So knowing that that love ethic might actually find a correlate in Hinduism or, Buddha or other traditions. And that's one of the wonderful things I think the Trinity Forum is inviting us all to do more of. Know other traditions. Know your own and know at least one other intimately. Thanks for that, Bob. So, um, Michael, I'm going to toss this next question to you, and it comes from Anne Snyder. And Anne asks, moral character, of course, draws upon universal truths about the way we as human beings flourish when we order our lives and loves in a certain accordance with an invisible law. But I'd argue there are aspects of character that are culturally conditioned, and that's a beautiful thing. As the U.S. grapples with a huge demographic unfurling and is currently facing the prospect of a historically dominant leadership class no longer holding the reins of unilateral influence, what are the cultural competencies and sensitivities we might teach our young people in hopes of widening the aperture of what certain universal and classical virtues might look like in different cultural milieus? Well, great question from Ann Snyder, as always. Uh, um, I think, uh, to echo one thing Robert said, I think crucial virtues there will, will be humility and love um, and recognize our own limits of, as, as we understand difference in ways that might surprise us and challenge us as we encounter people and cultures that are quite unique and, and perhaps even opposed in some ways certain values we hold. Um, I also think deep listening is going to be crucial to that. Um, listening is a way to really understand who we are, not just to hear people, but really to listen to them and, and engage them in a real way. Um, and I think in that way, um, inviting certain expressions of values is really crucial. So at Wake Forest, we use the arts to do that very well. We have a whole series, we're starting this next year on leading and listening. So think about how music might help us be attuned to different voices, not only in jazz or classical, but also in hip hop. And other ways that sort of different ways of expressing um, our own deep values, our deep loves um, might, might sound differently, but might find concord. Uh, Augustine has a great image that he takes from Cicero of the Commonwealth as being uh, a concord to actually have, have different voices and harmony coming together to form something they couldn't form on their own. I think right now we need a concord. Uh, we need that kind of Commonwealth uh, united around diverse voices, but common objects of love that can unite us together in this moment. I think those kind of sensitivities to the arts, to culture, to being open to new expressions of character will be critical as we think about how we expand our own vision of what leadership might look like. Right. If I might add, yes. I'm, I'm actually encouraged on this uh, point about, uh, let's say the children of uh, those who have been uh, relatively privileged and in power and in charge. Uh, and I'll tell you why I have hope, because of course, not only the diversity of those citizens who are in the streets demanding justice and fairness and equality and eradication of racism, everyone has noticed that, commented on it. It's an amazing phenomenon. It's good to see. There were elements of that during the 1960s uh, civil rights movement, but we see it really flourishing today. And I think that's important to celebrate. I spent a lot of time in local uh, high schools and even elementary schools in Atlanta. And uh, a lot of inner city African-American predominant uh, public schools, but also in some of the, uh, the city's premier sort of independent schools and private schools that are, that are, that are diverse, uh, but predominantly white. And I find those young students, young white students, are raising these concerns. How can we be better citizens? How do we overcome the prejudices and racism of the past. And they want to be on the right side of history. And sometimes I sit there, I hear a voice in my head and say, oh my God, this is extraordinary. This is so refreshing. And I'm just feeding. They won't let me go. They follow me out to the parking lot asking for reading lists. And I just think that's the, that's the goodness of America. That's the hope and promise of the future. Speaking of which, if you have that reading list and you'd like to share it, and same for you, yes. Michael, we'll put that in the show notes. I think we'd have a lot of listeners and viewers who would love to see that. <laughs> Thank you. Will do. 
Okay, our next question comes from Joseph Sherrard. I hope I've not mangled your name, Joseph. And Michael, we'll start with you on this one. And Joseph asks, conversation about moral leadership presumes that men and women of virtue are in positions of leadership. But in our current situation, it seems as if those positions are increasingly difficult for people of character to attain. How should people think about the hazards of aspiring to leadership? Those hazards being self-promotion, misguided ambition, or compromise? I think there are hazards, and uh, each profession has certain occupational hazards that might accompany that, that profession. And I think right now, um, one way we can actually resist those is being aware of them. Often what happens is we have a culture that actually embeds these assumptions within it, and institutions that kind of encourage or incentivize those assumptions in ways that actually create people of character who might be deformed in certain ways in their loves or their aspirations. So being alert to ways that biases and hazards actually form our cultures is crucial to that but also finding other examples um, that aren't always public uh, to be exemplars for us. Um, in my class, we have students watch Philosopher Kings, a documentary that won a few awards a few years ago about custodians at American universities that actually really do embody resilience, wisdom, courage, humility, and help them see that actually there are many kinds of examples that we can look to beyond those in public power, beyond those in positional authority. And so I think helping students realize that leadership is not simply a position, it's, it's a way of life, it's a way of influencing people, and, and you can be a leader in many different contexts and also a follower in many different contexts. So helping us understand how we're leading and then figure out the ways in which um, that might intersect with their other commitments and values. So I think that, that kind of self-awareness is gonna be crucial to that development of, of really ethical leaders uh, in different parts of our society. That'd be great. You know, Sherry, I think it also is a time in our history with a divided nation a nation growing in despair about moral values, uh, for leaders to step forth. Uh, you, we don't have to be perfect, but we do have to be sincere and earnest as we reach higher. And as uh, Anna Julia Cooper said, as, so that we lift as we climb. Uh, Martin King wrote that, uh, you know, in the past, leaders uh, in the African American community who were trustworthy and and hardworking and earnest have often avoided public uh, leadership roles, not run for office. Uh, and he said, we need to move to a day when those leaders, and that, at the time he named eminent scholars, uh, E. Franklin Frazier and others, uh, Ralph Bunch, they need to get off the bench and get involved in the messiness, grittiness of politics. And you know, I debated whether or not I would share this, Sherry. You don't even, you all don't know this, but today, I mean, yesterday I attended the, uh, the funeral of uh, Congressman John Lewis. The governor of Georgia has set a special election for September 29, and the deadline for uh, filing to be a candidate in that, uh, that special election was today, just before this call, and I filed uh, to, to appear on the ballot. So I mentioned that uh, because I think this will be public by the end of the day and uh, hold a good thought for me, uh, whisper a prayer for me, but it's in an effort to respond to Dr. King's call. You can't sit on the bench. I'm teaching ethics, get, in the, get into the game. So I'll let you know how that goes. And <laughs> like maybe that'll be the next book. <laughs> Well, I think this is the first time we've had a candidacy announcement on an online <laughs> conversation. So well, thank, thanks for sharing that, Bob. Yeah. Um, so our next question comes from Mark Bridgem, and it's a question for Michael. He asks, how much do you think character is wired in, more or less at birth? How much locked in early to young childhood? How much of the transition to adulthood? And how much is mutable as we age and mature? If mutable, how is change achieved either from within or without? Small question there. Small questions. Uh, well, I do think it actually um, can be taught throughout our whole life. In fact, research now shows that character changes across a whole lifespan. For a long time, people thought that by the time you're 10 or 12, or maybe 15 or 16, your character's kind of set. But now research now shows that actually we need to mature throughout our lives, especially um, throughout our early adulthood. Uh, there's research now about emerging adulthood between 18 and 29 years old, where um, it's a very important time of self-transformation um, because people are marrying later now. They're having more jobs, attending more education, moving more frequently. They're very unstable 
in their own identity and their own commitments. And so it's really important to give students a chance and people a chance to think about what is their vocation? What is their purpose? And how can it be beyond just themselves and serve the world? And so I think um, personality can be wired in certain ways. We have certain personality traits that we emerge from birth. And we might think that personality is the same as character, but actually I think they're, they're quite distinct in how we think about the moral value of certain traits. We might be extroverted in a certain way, um, but that doesn't make us courageous necessarily. And so I think there, there can be uh, movement there. As far as how do you actually shape that movement in the right direction? Uh, we do research at Wake Forest on the different ways character can be formed. And there are seven ways that, that really have been shown by the research in psychology, philosophy, neuroscience to be quite effective. Um, one's habituating virtue through practice like you would a skill, doing it over and over again until you actually habituate that way of thinking or acting. Second, reflecting on your experiences to understand how you might do differently going forward. Third is to engage exemplars, role models who actually embody good character, who perhaps, perhaps sort of have certain virtues to be their, their core identity. Fourth is to have dialogues about what the virtues are and why they matter. Fifth is to really understand our own biases and, and variables. And then and sixth is really to think about reminders that help us call us to our best selves. And then finally, what Robert said earlier was having accountability. Uh, friendships and community holds accountable to our best selves. Um, is really crucial to how we think about how character is formed. That is a rich list. Mm. Thank you, Michael. Bob, you look like you have something to add. Well, I think really a footnote to that wonderful uh, observation. In, in the book, uh, the first chapter, I do utilize Eric Erickson's important uh, frameworks for developmental psychology and understanding how people grow and evolve over the course of the life, life cycle. And it's interesting that the very first sort of personal developmental challenge, or as he calls it, crisis, is that of trust versus mistrust, developing trust, that uh, the young infant who sees a, a parent, a caregiver, who walks away and then returns, and the child develops this sense, this confidence that the universe is a safe place, because those who love me can walk away. I can be alone for a while, but they do return. I'm not abandoned. And a lot of social psychologists have observed that, you know, people, uh, people change through uh, two, two things, through great suffering and through great loves. And I think that this is a way in which a lot of people's lives can be redirected. Uh, we're going to suffer a lot. Many will suffer through COVID, economic crisis, the, uh, conflicts in our cities and, and nation. Suffering is a category I think we need to give more attention to. What happens to the human spirit in the context of suffering? But the other is, uh, is that of love, back to Michael's uh, topic. Michael, get the book out, please. Because <laughs> <laughs> we need more wisdom about love in the 21st century and how it can be a resource for both healing, healing uh, moral injury, but also building community. I'm worried about how a city like Atlanta, uh, how it heals. Uh, across various socioeconomic and ethnic racial divides. And I think that the King tradition uh, has a lot to offer that we've overlooked. And fortunately, younger leaders from Black Lives Matter to the students at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas who are, uh, you know, trying to uh, insist upon more responsible gun laws are trying to challenge us to figure out ways to build bridges and coalitions. Um, to echo Bob, I want to share a poem by Alice Walker about teaching, and why I think teaching is so important. It's called Told. My teacher was told by her teacher who loved her. You cannot shoot guns, you cannot drop bombs, your fists are forbidden to you, as are mean and hurtful words, no matter how carefully chosen. You have one weapon and one weapon only. Use it. It is the ability to teach. I think all of us as moral leaders have the ability to teach, to combat injustice, to sort of challenge division, to promote the common good, and to educate the next generation and each other how to be leaders of character that our world needs. I think that is our duty and our calling in this moment, and I'm very heartened by so many people who are already stepping up to answer that call, and I thank all of you for being among them. That's great. Thank you, Michael. Bob, last word. Thank you, Michael. Uh, my last word, two quotations, my favorite. Uh, quotes from Maya Angelou, and I was present in the crowd for the inauguration of Bill Clinton on that 
freezing January 1993 day as she said these words at the, at the inauguration. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. And finally, from Rabbi Maimonides, the world is equally balanced between good and evil. Your next act will tip the scale. Thank you. Bob, Michael, it has been a delight and an honor to get to talk with you. I hope we can have you back at some point soon. To all of you who are joining us, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. <laughs>